Hello and uh, welcome to my channel. The video that I'm posting today is a video that I already wanted to make for a, uh, a pretty long time. The, um, the very first video I, uh, I posted on my channel was one um, on this, this RF teaching kit. So this is basically a, a, a transmitter and, and receiver circuit um, that supports IQ modulation and, and, and that's something I will be pretty interested in and, and so I'll make my first video about this kit but a lot of experiments that I wanted to do back that time were not yet possible because I didn't have a good source of, of IQ signals and it took quite a while for me actually to, to get something like that into my, um, into my lab um, because even though a lot of like test and measurement equipment has become much more affordable over time um, and we have interesting offers by manufacturers um, from all over the place basically getting more affordable measurement equipment. Um, IQ signal generators are still fairly rare and specialized uh, equipment. And that is the reason why I started to look a little bit further and I ended up buying a, a, a second hand um, IQ uh, generator and that's the one over here. Actually, it's, it's one of the series of, uh, of quite a couple of devices that I've added recently to my, uh, to my lab. Uh, and I'm, I'm planning to do a number of experiments with all these devices here. But today I'll be focusing on this one. And this is a Roden and Swartz SMIQ um, signal generator. Um, and it can create like analog modulated signals, but it also can create a, a whole host of digital modulated signals with, uh, with vector and, and IQ modulation, as well as digital standards like the GSM standard and Tetra and a couple of other things, etc. Um, but today I want to focus specifically on some of the first experiments with this device and that is actually investigating the IQ signals on a regular type of oscilloscope. So like my, um, my other videos, I would like to start with a bit of background and theory, but you can skip that if you're not interested in it and jump right away to the, uh, to the experiments. And in the part of the experiments, first we're going to look at the IQ signals in the, in the time domain, and then we are specifically going to look into how to make vector diagrams on the one hand and constellation diagrams on the other hand using a regular type of um, oscilloscope. Now let's start with the uh, theory. So, why is uh, looking at this IQ modulation uh, interesting? Let me provide a little bit of uh, background. So, until the 1990s or so, for more than a hundred of years, amplitude modulation and frequency modulation has ruled our airwaves, radio, television, all the other types of, of radio communication, I would say both uh, on wire and wireless, we're using those modes of, uh, of modulation. Actually, the um, transistor radio on the bottom left, um, I still have one exactly like, uh, like that, a Philips uh, radio. But then in the 1990s, the increasing desire to, to communicate digital signals and also the desire for higher data rates on these digital signals called for modulation methods that would, would allow such higher um, data, data rates. And I think one of the first times when we actually saw this type of higher data rates via quadrature um, modulation uh, being implemented in, in a consumer device on a large scale was probably the, um, the modems being used for, uh, for calling into the, uh, to the internet, like the telephone call in modems. So there was the uh, V32 standard of the, the ITU, which was 9600 bits per second. Um, and they achieved that relatively high speed at that point of time by transmitting four bits of data at the same time. So any point of time a symbol was being transmitted representing four bits of the same time. So the actual data speed was 2400 symbols per second. That was called the baud rate of the modems. But the bit rate, uh, so was higher, was 9600 bits per second. Um, and that was a revolutionary technology um, at that time. And it did so basically by coding these, these bits in, uh, in a number of different ways, as you see in the constellation diagram shown here to the, uh, to the right. Now, more generally speaking, we can express uh, vector modulation signals or IQ signals in the uh, following way, uh, via a, a diagram typically called a polar diagram or a vector diagram or an IQ diagram when we talk about um, 
about analog signals, we, we, we typically talk about a, a vector and that vector has a vector has a given length and it has a given uh, phase, which is a rotation from, from zero degrees. And, and that determines the combination of those, the, the in-phase component of it and the, the Q, the quadrature component of it. When we talk of, um, of digital signals, when there's only a number of discrete values available for the I and the Q, we typically express that typically as simply the, the I value and as being the in-phase value and the, the, the Q value, which is the quadrature value. Now here we see a number of common constellations. So that's the number of defined points that the, the, the values can take. On the left we see the, um, the, the, the eight level uh, phase key shifting uh, method. And there basically we're only shifting the, uh, the phase here. So if you look well, you will see that the, the constant is, the, the amplitude, sorry, is, is constant. Um, that can be an advantage because that means that there is no issues with linearity, for example, of amplifiers, of power amplifiers, because the, there's always the same as the amplitude going on. Uh, but the number of values, different values we can transmit in the, in the same symbol is still relatively limited. In the middle, we see the, the digital 16 uh, QAM modulation method. So we, uh, we can transfer any one out of these 16 values at the, uh, at the same time. And on the right, we see 32 QAM, where we can transmit more values within any given symbol, uh, but the points are also relatively closer together. And that means that it might get more difficult to set the dots apart in a reliable manner, especially if we're dealing with noise, with nonlinearity or, or other types of, uh, of effects. Now, what we're looking here at, 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 at the constellation, so that's the number of points where the data could be coded in, um, but it of course, any signal uh, that we transfer this with is a continuous signal. So there's also transition between these points. So in that sense, uh, we can also speak of two different diagrams here. So the vector diagram on the left shows the whole signal over time, including the transitions between the different decision moments. That's the continuous signal. On the right, we see an example of a constellation diagram, and it only shows the value at the moment of the decision moment. So that is the moment when the receiver tries to determine what the value is and translate that into bits of data. Now, when we, um, when we consider these transitions eh, going from, from the one constellation point to the other constellation point, then we also have multiple possibilities. And I'm showing them in the, uh, in the picture right here. So we see three different pictures here, and all of them are forms of, of, of QPSK in, uh, in a way, eh, quadrature uh, phase shifting. Um, and, and all, the, all the, uh, the ones that I'm showing here on this sheet basically have four constellation points, but still they're different. The one on the left, and that is, for example, QPSK, as we find it in the 3GPP 3D standard, um, has four constellation points um, at the four corners, basically, and it allows a transition between any of these points. So from any constellation point, you can go to any other constellation point. In the middle one, where we see a version of QPSK as it is, was implemented in the 2G IS-95 standards for, for mobile telephony in the, in the US, we also see one in which we got four constellation points. However, within this system, only transitions between the corners are allowed and there's no transition from the upper left to the, the, the bottom right, um, etc. And so that can be a, um, a designer's choice because there can be particular issues or challenges related to, uh, to such transitions. Uh, but of course, that, that lowers the overall data rate. And, and as illustration on the right, we find an, another quadrature uh, PSK uh, method, um, which was implemented by a, a satellite system, by medium orbit satellites, by ICO global communications. And there we see four constellation points, but in a different constellation than the one on the left, but also allowing basically transition between all the different points. And so we don't only need to consider the, the constellation point, but also the transitions that we can have between them. Now, it gets particularly interesting when we understand, want to understand better if there are imperfections in the signal and some type of error coming in here. And there can be a variety of different types of, uh, of errors coming into the signal, either as a result of the transmitter, uh, as a result of the channel in between, 
or as a result of the receiver. And, and here we see four of the main types of, of error. There is the, uh, the phase error on the left, there's the compression when we're working with, for example, nonlinear amplifiers, either on the transmitter side or on the receiver side. That's inspent spurious noise. And totally on the right side, there is random noise, like Gaussian noise. And that, is, that can be both within the, um, the amplifiers, which can be noisy, but can of course also be a result of the, uh, of the channel itself, a noisy channel. And I'm not going to go great in detail here, but I would like you to refer to an excellent source on this, the YouTube video, which is cited here below, and which is also the source of the, the picture that you're seeing here. Now, let's look a little bit at IQ signal generation. I'm specifically now talking about the IQ signal generation as we find it in the signal generator that I'm using to make this, um, this video. So how are these signals exactly created? Well, first of all, we're going to need some, um, some data. Um, and it could be um, a set of stored data in, um, in the instrument itself, in, in, in a piece of memory that you might be uploading. Um, we could be talking about random data. Um, what I'm going to be using here today, and that's quite common, it is not random data, but almost random data called pseudo-random binary sequences. So that is a determined set of data. So it's going to repeat itself every so much time or so, but its characteristics are almost like random data. Then after that, we get a phase of coding and the coding basically determined how the data is going to be used also in terms of, of, of the transition and robustness against um, errors. So each of the data bits results in, in, in the data bit after the coding took place. And then it's going to be mapped to the I and Q interfaces via a, a, a mapping process. And then we got basically a pure I signal and a Q signal. And those I and Q signals are actually the the signals that I'm going to be analyzing in this video. But eventually, uh, these signals are, are typically being transferred uh, over, over the airwaves or via a wire, so they have to be modulated. And so we see here the typical design of an IQ modulator, which basically is that we have the, uh, the I signal, which is, uh, is modulated, and we got a Q signal, which is also modulated, but by 90 degrees out of phase. And these are added together, and then finally they go to a RF converter, where they are modulated on a higher radio frequency where we, uh, we actually want it to go. And this is still a, a simplified kind of, uh, of representation. What we don't show here, for example, yet is the, the baseband filtering, because typically you want to have some filtering, otherwise you're going to have uh, undesired high harmonics in your signal. Um, so there are all types of, of, of baseband filtering um, and other types of processes also going on. Uh, but this represents kind of the main steps into the IQ signal generation, also in the particular device that we're using here today. And to say a little bit more of that, that particular device, um, I'm pretty excited uh, about it. Um, I'm enjoying it a, um, a lot. So it's the SMIQ, uh, and in, in, in my case, it's the, the model number 03B. So that is a signal generator that was introduced around uh, 2002. Although the, the B model, which I got here, came a little bit later and has, uh, has better specifications. It was built upon earlier models like the SME and the SMT signal generators, uh, which were analog generators and then a bit of digital signals. And this is the first one really fully supporting IQ and having all the I.O. options for it. Um, so some of his main features are that, well, we can do analog vector modulation. We can do digital modulation and we have a choice from, from many different uh, IQ uh, modulation mode and interestingly enough these these modes are really internally generated unlike many other IQ signal generators where you first have to create the IQ signal IQ signal in a separate piece of software program and then you have to transfer that particular data set into the device and then it plays it as, as an arbitrary sequence or so um, which is much more cumbersome and the nice thing about this device it really creates it out of the box. You do all the settings and it creates the IQ signals that you're interested in. And then the SMIQ can also generate signals that comply with a number of digital standards like the, the 2G uh, GSM mobile phone signal, uh, the DECT uh, cordless uh, phone signal for phones at home and um, the 3G CDMA uh, standard. So it, it generates yeah, signals that comply fully basically with these, these, these standards. So you can look at the power envelope and anything with it. 
We can do advanced features at least for that time, like, like frequency hopping and, and ramping. Uh, the device supports mechanical as well as uh, electronic attenuators, and so you have a very huge attenuation range. And it has a high amount of high degree of customizability. So you can use control list, and I'll show a little bit about that later, generating all type of sync and trigger signals uh, within what you want to do. And you really got like a crazy number of, of IO, IO ports. I think there's something like 34 IO ports in terms of triggering and syncing um, and, and that type of things, etc. And then not counting normal serial type of, of, of ports and, uh, and, and the IEEE uh, command port. Um, so it's quite amazing how well you can use this. Um, and from this you can also see that this was not only designed to be used in, 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 in R&D type of processes, but also in production environments where these units were used for, for continuous type of testing. So, so some of them have like millions and millions uh, of, of, of usages of the relays and the attenuators uh, being used in that context. You got advanced options like fading, like, like bit error testing, or using it as a full arbitrary unit in, in both I and Q. And I must say that I find this device having a very pleasant user interface. Later on in the video, we're going to see some more modern devices of, of, of Roden and Swartz um, that are more based on a computer operating system. Some people might think they, they, they look much more impressive, but, but actually I prefer the user interface that we got here on the SMIQ. Um, and it also starts up in less than 10 seconds, which is something that I always like about devices. It's also a very, very solid box, but it also weighs in at something like 26 kilo. It was, uh, it, it, um, it was quite a big surprise when it got, uh, it got delivered to our, our home, how heavy um, and solid this, uh, this box was. Now, I just told you about the, uh, the many different IQ modulation modes that it has, and here you get like a quick overview. Different type of modulation modes ranging from from one bit per symbol um, all the way until eight bits per symbol in 256 UAM. So, so I really like this device, this device for the great variety of different uh, modulation modes that it, uh, it offers just like that out of the box. Now let's go and do some actual uh, experiments. We got the um, the signal generator, the IQ signal generator down here, um, and its two output for I and Q are connected to the oscilloscope using uh, 50 ohm uh, loads uh, here. It's a 50 ohm uh, terminated signal. And I'm showing on channel one and two now the I and the Q component that are coming out of the signal generator. The signal generator is also creating like an RF signal, a modulator signal. I'm not using that right now. I put a, the level really low, so we're not disturbing anybody. It's at 900 megahertz, um, but there's going to be almost nothing at, um, at all. So let's try to go and see here on the signal generator actually to create some of these IQ signals. So we've got a lot of modulation options. We've got analog modulation vector modulation, so continuous IQ signals, and digital modulation. And that's where we, um, we want to be. We're going to go to that, um, that menu, and well, we're simply going to turn that particular function on. And I get to see some signals here on the I component, the real component, uh, only the real component. And, and why is that? Actually, the current form of modulation is amplitude shift keying. So, Basically, we're only uh, modulating the, uh, the real component uh, here. Um, but, of course, there are, there are other modulation uh, methods that would allow me to... Um, well, let me see how to get there. Other modulation methods, and I go here to the menu. And, for example, if we go to quadrature, phase shift keying, we would expect both components to be modulated. And now, there we go. So now we actually have a IQ signal and we can see here that each of them can basically take two values, um, zero, one, or however you want to, uh, to refer to it. And we also see that in this particular modulation uh, method, we got two uh, bits per signal being transferred independently of, uh, of each other. So this is our first sign that we can get to see uh, IQ signals. Um, we're not, we're not synchronized yet, uh, yet here. Um, I'll get to that in a, in a moment. 
but before doing that, um, I want to go to a little bit more sophisticated uh, um, uh, modulation uh, method, and I'm going to choose here. Now, this device, and that's one of the reasons why I really love the, the SMIC, has a, a quite staggering amount of, of options here in terms of its, its, its modulation. Actually, I'm, I'm showing them here right now on the screen. And the one I'm going to pick out is here is the 8 uh, PSK, which will have multiple levels in, in I and Q. So I'm going there. Yeah, and that's what we're seeing right now. Huh? We can clearly see multiple levels. I'll just do a single capture here on the scope, single trigger, and we, we can actually see here a discrete number of, um, of signals. Now, th this is all great. Um, the thing is a little bit, if I got this on, on, on continuous my scope, um, I don't have any syncing going, uh, going on. Now, I can solve that basically um, thanks to the, uh, the quite generous number of, uh, of in-out type of, uh, of ports on this uh, device. Um, I was quite impressed, actually I was, I was doing a little count and this device has a total of 34 in-outs for things like sync and clock and triggering and data, etc. Even in the standard version, it becomes more if you, if you install additional options like uh, uh, bit error uh, checking and, and, and fading and that type of stuff. So 35 I.O. connectors, some of them input, some of them output, some of them, most of them switchable between input and output. And I'm not even considering like the serial port and the IAE port, um, and things for, for, for software update, etc. Uh, really the, the, the type of technical I.O. Uh, signals. Many of them come out by, by BNC connectors on the front panel or, or on the back panel, but others are basically um, combined, hidden on a, a D-sub uh, connector, 25 pin um, D-sub uh, connector. So I, I brought this connector basically to the, um, to the front here uh, with an extension cable. And what I'm doing here is I've got this little breakout box here where I can connect all these different signals to my scope. Um, and since they're all kind of digital signals, I will be losing the logic channels of the scope. Um, so I have quite a bit more options here to, uh, to get signals in. So what I'm going to do now is look at some of these, uh, these additional signals that I've prepared here. And I'm going to start here the, uh, the logic channel. And what we see here is a number of, of, of bits going up and down. And what we basically see here is that D8 is the bit clock. So for every bit cycle, basically is giving a clock. D9 is the word clock. Um, since we are working here with three symbols per second, we should have a new symbol clock every three bits, so every three bit clocks. Um, but I want to synchronize this, this whole sequence basically here. Now, as I told in the introduction, I'm not using a fully random sequence, but it's a pseudo-random pseudo sequence here. So somehow we need to find the start of that sequence and to make the scope triggering on the start of that sequence. Now, how can we do that? Um, then we go to one of the options here in this, this device. If we go here to the source of the signal, I'm telling here it is a pseudo-random bit sequence of nine bits. So that has a total of, I think, about 150 cycles before it gets back to the, to the original point. We'll see it in a moment. And one of the options I have here on the device is make a control list. And if I make that control list and I go edit and view it, I can make a list and then I can basically set a number of things for external signals going in or out, uh, triggers, output signals, whatever. So I'm creating something with a total of 511 bits, that's exactly the length of my, my, my pseudo-random cycle here. And I'm basically saying, in the beginning, I want a certain trigger signal to be one, and then in all the other steps, I want it to be zero. Um, and that's actually the, the, the D10, D10 we are getting here, and also creating a, another signal which is a little bit longer, so I can easier um, see it. So this allows me basically to create a trigger signal for the whole sequence here. So let's go and try on, on, on trigger of that. I go to my trigger options on the scope. There is the source. And I connected it to source 10 if I'm right. And there we go. Now it's all steady. So we see the whole sequence of 511 bits being now synchronized, triggered on the scope, thanks to the trigger signal that I created myself in the, um, in the list over here. 
Um, so this gives us a little bit of better view of this, this type of signals. I could do this basically with any modulation here. Uh, I'll have to look into the length and the number of, uh, of bits per, per word and a couple of other things to make sure they're, uh, they're, going, to be, uh, they're going to be steady. Now, exploiting a little bit more the I.O. options on this, uh, this device, um, out of these ports we can actually, uh, actually also get the, uh, the data uh, that's in and out and the data that is in a particular word symbol that's being transmitted. So I put that on, on a couple of other channels here and as you will see here there's a data bus and, and since I'm synced I can nicely uh, read it um, and I actually see here some bits are jumping up and down and some bits are not. Why only some bits? Because basically I'm using now three symbols. Um, there we are. I should go back to the relative menu here. That was the standard modulation. Yeah, three bits per symbol. So effectively there are three different bits here that I'm coding in one given signal. Um, and I can basically go and see exactly then what type of pseudo random code is being sent out as a as a symbol. Um, and since the scope also has decoding possibilities for, for buses, I could exploit those as well. So just to make a little bit space for it, um, let me just turn them off. The, the nice thing is that if you turn them off, they're, they're simply not visible on the screen, but they're still available for, for bus purposes. So if I go to um, a parallel bus, and well, I already predefined it, it's a parallel bus of now it's of 8 bits now, I, I, I could have reduced it to, uh, to 3 bits only. I can configure the bus here, I can turn around the order of the signals. I, I must admit I haven't even checked it for this particular purpose. Um, I can choose whether I want to see my bus in, in binary or in, in hexadecimal signals. I'll keep it at hexadecimal right now. Um, and what to get to see here basically is, is the exact bus that I'm sending over the... Uh, um, over the IQ generator. So this demonstrates a little bit how we can investigate um, the IQ signals in the, um, in the time domain. Um, now I can do this analysis of course with all the different modulation methods that we got um, available here for IQ coding. Uh, so I'm still on, on 8 uh, PSK here and I see only 3 bits being coded. But if I go to a more sophisticated one, let me go and select for example 256 Quadrature modulation, 256 QM, where, uh, where 8 bits per symbol are being coded. There we go. Yeah, and, and there we get to see actually all the 8 bits being coded within every single signal, uh, symbol that's being, uh, being sent over. Uh, so also this one, of course, I can clock um, to, um, to the scope using the signal that I generated for that. There we go, uh, so we see all the bits here um, and again we see here the bit clock going much faster here because every symbol clock is going to correspond to 8 uh, bit clocks over here and we have a signal here with much more discrete um, values here. And actually the next, that's the next phase that we're going to go to because now we're going to try to investigate um, the, the XY properties or the, the IQ properties uh, in terms of, uh, of XY uh, diagram. Well, now we've finished looking at, uh, at these signals in the, uh, in the time domain. I want to move and try to see if we can see these, uh, uh, these in the, um, as a vector plot or, or as, a, as a constellation. Um, so for that I will be using um, XY mode of the, uh, of the oscilloscope. I just connected a mouse, so I'm not going to be always in the way with my, uh, with my hands. We don't need the, uh, the digital bus here um, anymore. I don't think we're going to need uh, syncing really. So we've got the same two signals here again and we're still at, uh, at 8 uh, PSK where we, we started off with. Now let me go down to the uh, XY menu um, via the Epson XY. And there we go. And actually what, 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 what you can see is one of the reasons I picked this particular scope here because the RTB scope can show an XY picture, but at the same time the, uh, the time domain pictures that, uh, that give rise to that, that signal, which I think is, uh, is convenient. It's the only oscilloscope that I have that, that basically does that. So we already see basically here a, 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 a vector diagram uh, being showing up. So let me go and take it and 
put it kind of in the middle of the, uh, if the graph, I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. I'm afraid I'm going to use my hands for that because I'm not exactly sure how to do that with the, uh, with the mouse. And there we see, there we go. Huh? We, we go and see a, a vector diagram and we actually see the different constellation points here, but we also see basically the trace moving from the, uh, the one point to the other because we're looking into the, the full time domain here. So this is the vector representation here. And it's shown for the particular time frame that's now set in my time basis. That's why I see jumping a little bit, uh, but basically depending on the time base that I'm choosing, I will see a particular part only of it. I will see much more or I'll see a really long sequence and then I see actually it all closed. What I can see from this sequence as well, that is with this particular type of, of coding that I'm using here, basically the signal can jump from any constellation point to any other constellation point. I think I basically see every possible connection here point to point that you can make in this, 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 um, this graph over here. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of nice to see the, um, the XY uh, information here. As we already have seen or can see in the uh, time domain uh, diagram, I'll make it a little bit longer here. Uh, the, uh, the signal is camping a little bit longer at the steady states and jumping from the one state to the other. That also depends on the particular filter that's being set here. I'll not go too much into it, but um, we can also sit here uh, a variety of, um, of filter types here. Now some Gaussian filter that will determine how it goes from one state to the other. But the fact that it's spending more time here on these points here than it does on the tradition can also be made visible in the XY diagram by using um, the, the, the rainbow or, or the other color coding uh, things of the scopes. If I do that and I'll select channel two for that, for waveform color, I could go to rainbow for example. And now we basically get a bit more information how long the signal is staying here on the constellation points with our red and how long the signals are in, in transition, basically. So this already gives us a little bit of hint about what the constellation diagram is going to be. Um, but of course I wanted to get better than that and really see the pure constellation diagram. I'll be getting to that in a, in a second. But before doing so, um, I would still like to look a little bit at other type of, 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 uh, of signals, more sophisticated uh, signals. Um, so let me... Um, Turn off for a moment the, um, the rainbow thingy again. There we go. Back to default. And I'll go here to a more sophisticated type of modulation. So let's say that we go to... ...16 QAM. Yeah. Yeah, so here we see very clearly here that we get into 16 different uh, points on the constellation diagram, as was to be, um, as was to be uh, expected here. Um, again, seeing it both in the time domain and in the frequency domain. And depending again on how we do the time-based settings, uh, we, we, we will see a part of this, this, this picture. Huh? We would see something like this. Or if we take a longer time base, then we would see like the, uh, the full picture. And here it seems again, but I'm not totally sure that in this constellation, uh, or it's not a constellation, in this vector diagram basically, I see connection between every single spot and another spot. I can do that with a slower time base. I can of course also use persistence on the, um, on the scope. Let me, that's a very slow time base, so let me choose a bit of a... Yeah, time base like this one. So if I choose persistence on the scope, sorry for using my hand again, I'm simply quicker doing that. I'm turning persistence to infinitive, and then he will basically plot all these connections without ever taking them away again. So I think everything is basically connected here. So, um, but that's basically a choice. We could have other modulation methods basically where a strategic choice was made not to make a certain transition from a one point to another. And there might be good technical reasons to uh, to do so. Now, the next part of the um, experiment, I would like to look at um, a constellation uh, diagram. And what is really the constellation diagram? This is a diagram where we see the I value and the Q value only in the specific times when 
a sample is being taken, when it's being evaluated by the receiver. So what we basically want here, and let's do a single run here, that we pick the signal on a stable moment when the information is exactly there that we want to read out the information that was transmitted. So what we basically want to do is look at the moment when the, uh, the symbol clock was, uh, was coming by, right? So I'm going back to my, uh, my signal here. Um, I could uh, sync here on my, my, my signal clock. Uh, I think it's going to be signal um, 10. Yeah. Yeah, now, now I'm at my signal clock. So I want to sample exactly at, at the point basically here. You see that at a D9, very small, uh, where the signal clock uh, comes in. Um, so I want to look only at these points in time. So I want my XY diagram only to show when this upgoing uh, pulse is, um, is here. Um, now, now I come to the other reason why I chose the, the Roden and Swartz oscilloscope. Um, because in its XY mode it supports blanking. So that's a way to turn on and turn off the display, uh, the waveform display during the, the XI mode. And that's going to be a very useful function basically that we can use basically to look only at a certain point in, um, in time. This is actually the only oscilloscope I have here um, that can, uh, can do that. Well, I have some older analog oscilloscopes that have blanking um, inputs. Um, but they, they probably won't persist that short, short value very well. Uh, this is my only digital oscilloscope that can do blanking. Uh, actually, it's not in the specifications, um, but it's an uh, undocumented mode um, that, that does work. I'll get to that in a moment, but first we need to create a signal that we want to blank with, of course. And in order to, um, to do that, I have um, created a... Um, I, I'm creating a signal and I'm using my trusted uh, signal, signal generator for it. So why I'm doing this, let me turn it on, that signal, and the signal is over there. So what I'm doing here basically is that the, uh, the symbol uh, clock is going into the signal, is triggering it, and the signal is creating a burst of only one pulse basically, only a short pulse basically. So it, there's a pulse as an input, there's the same pulse as an output. But why I'm doing this basically, well, for two reasons. First of all, I can set the width of that pulse. So I can basically decide how long the period is going to be that the display is going to be on. Secondly, I can also play with the right amplitude level, etc. And that is important because I know the blanking function requires certain amplitudes uh, to, to, to go black and to go on again. And I have to experiment with that a little bit. Um, actually, in the, uh, the, the scope background document that I prepared, I'll put it down in the, in the notes, uh, I've written a little bit about the, uh, the blanking part. But so that are basically the two functions that we got here. So here I got the blanking signal, and I can play around with the width of that. And so if you look at this orange signal over here, and I'm turning here, you will see it gets smaller and smaller. So I can basically play with the amount of blanking uh, or the blanking period uh, going on. Okay, so now everything is, um, is set. I will go to XY mode in the, um, in the oscilloscope. Let me go there without going in front of the screen. It's hard to see the little cursor because I'm far away from it. Um, I'm, getting to see, uh, I'm getting to see something here. My, um, my signal is, 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 uh, is still synced to something. Maybe I can just turn the sync off. I think that's, that's fine. Yeah, okay. So, so here we got a signal uh, going on uh, here. Um, and next thing I have to do now is activate the, uh, the blanking in the oscilloscope. Um, and like I said, this is, uh, this is an undocumented feature, but you can activate it using the, uh, the, the SE. SP interface from the device. That's very simple via the web interface. I'm going to show you now the two commands that you're doing. So the first command I have to do is set the, um, the channel I'm using the Z-blanking for. So I'm going to choose channel number four on the um, oscilloscope. And the second thing is that I have to do is turn the, the blanking on. And I'll do that with the, uh, with the command blank, uh, Z mode analog. Uh, because you also have digital blanking, but I'm going to do analog blanking. I tried that before and it worked for this purpose. And let's look at the screen. Click. Yeah, there we go. And if you 
look well now, huh? you see we only have little dots left. Um, and now I'm set at 8 milliseconds. If we would increase that a little bit, what we would actually see happening now is that the dots get a little bit longer and we get a little bit longer period there. Huh? So you see here, this is longer, gets a little bit shorter, shorter, until I bring it all the way back to, for example, 10 milliseconds or so, then I'm really capturing the little dots. Now the little dots might be kind of hard to see, but of course I can go to uh, persistence and have them show a little bit longer. Uh, now I'm taking a persistence of three seconds. That, that sounds like, uh, looks like quite right here. Uh, let's turn it off again. We'll also get it in the, in the time domain. Huh? So here we see exactly the constellation diagram. We only see at the moment that the sampling point is being taken. And I can determine with the single generator here both the length of the period at which we're looking at the sample. And I can also have some delays, positive or negative, if I would like to move the sample time a little bit around uh, relative to the, uh, to the symbol uh, clock here. So this is actually what we're, we're interested in seeing, what I was trying to do, see the real constellation diagram. What I'll also do now is turn on the grid of the scope a little bit more. So I'm going here to the, the grid function. Um, I'm sorry for my hands. Yeah, make it a more clear grid. And what I'm doing here basically, and, and I did that, that, that before actually, that I'm showing like all the, uh, the centers of the constellation point in the middle basically of a, um, of a division here in the grid. So this way I can start to investigate basically where my, my signals are, um, are going to. And, and for example, when we, uh, when we have distorted signals or they look differently than we would expect them uh, to be. Now in my last experiment of today, I would like to see how we can use constellation diagrams uh, to see if any distortions or problems are, are occurring. Um, and for that, I'm adding one more instrument here to, uh, to the setup. And this is a, a Roden and Swart basement signal generator and fading simulator. Um, and actually I will be using this device as a way to add noise or other types of uh, distortion two IQ signals. So in the configuration I'm using this, we got two IQ, in, IQ inputs, which simply come from the, the, the generator, and two IQ outputs. And I can determine here if there's any type of distortion being added to these signals. So this is a device specifically made for that type of purposes. You can have like time distortions, like fading, uh, like reflection, but also noise and, and, and non-linear type of distortion, etc. So I'm doing a, a couple of experiments with that. And of course I want to see whether the setup that I made with the oscilloscope is able to show that type of uh, distortions. And I have chosen a um, 32 QAM signal here. And here we can see the constellation diagram. I'm again using this device here the, to, to create a pulse of the, the right uh, length and to be able to show it. And we see that the outer points are not used in this modulation method. So this was a choice uh, by, by design that it would not be using the outer parts. It probably has to do with the required linearity of, 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 of amplifiers um, for, the, uh, for the transmitter and the receiver. Uh, and um, so that, 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 that can be a choice. So here right now we're seeing the, um, the constellation diagram when everything is running fine without any added distortion. And now I'm gonna go here to my, my device and I'm gonna activate the menu to add some forms of distortion here. And I'll start with adding noise. This is regular type of Gaussian noise that I'm going to add here to the, uh, to the process. So, I'm turning on this part, and as you can already see in the, um, in the diagram over here, the dots get considerably larger. Um, and right now I've set it to a signal-to-noise ratio of 40 dBs, but if I'm going to play around with this, I'm going to back to 30 dBs, and we see that the dots are getting much larger. And when my channel will be only 20 dB, you see the dots are getting so large that probably there's lots of errors going on here. We cannot determine reliably anymore what the supposed value is at the side of the receiver. Um, 
And if I go to a single noise ratio of, um, of only 10 dB or, or only worse, you see there's, there's nothing but noise left basically. And so this is basically giving us a clear indication. Huh? So I'm changing it again to a better signal noise ratio. I had a persistence set here of, of about three seconds. So it takes three seconds to get back to the uh, to a stable uh, mode here again and, and back to 40 um, dB. So I think this very nicely shows how we can use this oscilloscope here to look at the constellation diagram. Of course, if we want to do an analysis, how many bit errors this actually uh, results in, then there are also specific methodologies that some advanced measurement devices will support, uh, like bit error testing, where you actually compare the bits sent out by the, the bits being received after the IQ demodulation, and you would actually count how many of these errors would take place. Actually, this device is able of doing that with a specific software option added to it, which actually I, I, I don't have. Uh, but this device allows such measurements to be taken if you have the right software option. So now we just saw a, a experiment where I've been adding noise. I will continue the experiment, the last experiment here, with adding other types of impairments. Um, and by other types of impairments, I basically mean that this also allows us um, basically to do other wrong things to the IQ signal. So what I will do right now is what is called a, a quadrature offset. And let me see if I start playing around with that and I put it at the maximum value. And as you might see here, everything has moved around. You see the little dots in the beginning, they were in the middle of the display and right now they have moved to the left here. So the whole thing has turned around more or less by, well, exactly by 10 degrees. And if I will be going around into the other direction, oh, it goes very fast. Now it shifts to the, to the right of 10 degrees. Okay, let, 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 let me go here for a moment. So I'm going left 10 degrees slowly towards zero. Now it's correct again. Five degrees bending to the right and 10 degrees bending to the right. So here we can simulate basically that we got an imperfect channel or, or whatever circuitry in between that results in some shifting of the phase uh, of the quadrature signal here. Okay, this brings me to the end of the experiment. And now I think our setup that we have over here basically shows us that we can start doing experiments on real channels and transmitters and receivers and IQ modulators and demodulators. So I could start basically now measuring devices like this and see how well they perform basically um, in, in, in a circuit, being able now to look both as vector and constellation diagrams.